doesn't make any sense. Hey, um, I got your new QK65 prototype, and I think you made an error on the label. It says it's $150? What? That's not an error? Are you sure? Wait, wait. You do realize that it says $150, right? Like $150. Oh, is it like $150 for the case, and then like $50 for the PCB, and $20 bucks for the plate? Because that makes... What? No. The whole kit is 150? Including the case? Uh... You guys might want to get a new accounting team, man. But... Can I reserve a black chroma version for myself? No, I'm serious. Welcome back to the channel. You know, there are so many game changer, enthusiast level entry boards out there. And some proven OG ones as well. However, today we're gonna see this market get disrupted by this. This is the QK65 by QWERTY Keys. Who is QWERTY Keys, you ask? Have you guys heard about Owl Labs? Yup, the guys that brought you the likes of Jelly Epoch and Mr. Suit. The same guys that decided to put a thin layer of PE foam on top of a PCB because that makes the keyboard sound more better. Yup, those guys are back at it again to change up the game, but this time with a sister company called QWERTY Keys, that's aiming to bring high-end typing experiences at attainable prices. And now this QK65, this thing starts at 150 bucks. I would actually put that in like the enthusiast level entry um, level. And what I mean by that is it has all the great features to really get somebody who's more serious about the hobby get into it even deeper. So it's kind of like a gateway keyboard, I would say. It would also mean that it competes with the likes of a Tofu, the NK65, the Keychron Q2, the Bakaneko, and more. But you know the thing is, this thing, it really shouldn't be a $150 keyboard in my opinion. I have seen $300 keyboards deliver less than this QK65. So either Owl Labs or QWERTY Keys is doing something wrong, or they're doing something very right. Or all that PE foam has gotten to their heads. So let's dig into this, shall we? So when you first grab the QK65, the first thought is, why is this little box so heavy? It's crazy heavy actually. Then you realize it's filled with a lot of stuff. Mind you, this is the review sample, so I'm sure it came with a bit more extra, but most of the stuff you see here, you get with the kit, like the case, as a gift from QWERTY Keys. You get the basic stuff like stabs. These are owl stabs by the way, and they cost 20 bucks a set usually. Then you get a small screwdriver set with the screws. Then you get a coil cable. It's nothing fancy, but still a nice touch. All considered a gift from QWERTY Keys. It's like at least $50 worth of gifts. Then inside this nice case is all the main stuff you need to build a keyboard, like the PCB. In this case, I received both the soldered and the hot swap PCB. For this review, I decided to use the hot swap because I'm lazy. Both the hot swap and the soldered version comes in this pale orange color, which is a nice unique touch. It also comes with foam, both plate and the famous Owl Labs, or in this case, QWERTY Keys PE foam for that marbly sound. Looking at the PCB in more detail, you can see the usual KO hot swap sockets in south facing configuration. I mean, it's an enthusiast level keyboard, right? No RGB of any kind on this PCB, but you know, for me, that's okay because I turn off all the lights anyways. And it also has a slew of flex cuts to provide some give and work with the plate to make your typing more comfortable. A couple of interesting things about this hot swap PCB. First of all, the caps lock socket. The QWERTY keys designed the PCB with board north and south facing for this one key. Why? Because it means you can use both regular or stepped caps lock keycaps. That's pretty awesome. These little details are pretty important. Next one is the USB port. Unlike its more expensive brethren, the QK65 has it soldered onto the main PCB. Normally when I see this, I think, oh no. Even for a gasket keyboard, the flex is pretty much all gone. But it wasn't the case for this keyboard. I'll show you that later as well. As expected, the PCB is VIA and QMK compatible as well. All right, let's look at the plates now. My sample came with two plate samples, the FR4 and POM plates. Good thing that these are actually one of my favorite plates, so I was really thrilled to see this. 
I love the dry and crisp sound of the FR4 and the nice soft pop of Palm. In addition, they are offering plates in aluminum as well as PC in case you're looking for a little bit of variety as well. A lot of different options being offered. Like the PCB, some plates like this FR4 is also offered with strategic flex cuts to allow for more forgiving typing experiences. So stiffer ones like FR4 and aluminum has a flex cut, softer plates like Palm and, and PC actually doesn't come with it because Palm and PC is already so flexible to start with. Like most premium boards out there, wait, this is $150, can I even call this premium? Honestly though guys, everything I've covered so far does not indicate that this is a budget board at all. Despite the price point, this thing is premium, it's a premium keyboard. I mean, how many $150 keyboards do you see out there that has flex cut PCBs, flex cut plates, stepped cap sock support, gasket jackets and socks, electrophoresis colors, stainless steel weights? Wait, I'm saying too much, right? <laughs> Moving on to more content. So, about that gasket jacket and socks. Instead of using standard pour on foams for the plates, the QK65 employs gasket jackets and socks. So the long gray ones are the jackets, and they fit over the entire tab. The small little black ones are the socks, and they fit only on the edges. And this is how they look like when they're installed onto the plate tabs. This is actually very similar to what they did for the Mr. Suit. So what is the difference? Well, it's simple. If you want a softer typing experience, go for the socks. It has less material to compress, and also allows the tab itself to flex. Unlike the socks, the jackets provide a stiffer typing experience with a firmer support, so it's totally up to you. With that said, I like comfort, so I'm going to go with the socks. So now let's move on to the big important piece, the case. Very creative how they did this thing, so let me show you. First of all, it comes loaded with filler. In this case, both pour-on foam and silicone dampener. If you look at the silicone dampener, it's not some thin flimsy one, but rather it's a chonker. It's like the one they put inside the NK65. The pour-on foam is pretty standard. Why both, you ask? Well, they do different things better. I'll touch upon that later in a different video on what kind of impact foams and silicones have. So moving on to the case itself. Mine is white, e-white. Do you remember what I said about electrophoretic deposition? Yup, usually comes as an option for more expensive boards. Well, this one's got it. The finishing is also very smooth, even, and nice. It's actually about $20 more for the e-finish, but you know, that's because of the overall process and the cost incurred with that as well. So it's also got this blocker here. It's chunky, it's thick and solid. Then you got the backside and the board starts to get really interesting. My QK65 is the e-white and black combination. It's like this high contrast stormtrooper or Snoopy look. It does come in a lot of different colors as well, so check it out. But that black rear part that you see isn't an aluminum piece, it's actually stainless steel. Stainless steel? Why is it black then? Well, it's because it's PVD coated. PVD is very similar to electrophoretic deposition. It actually stands for physical vapor deposition. So instead of a liquid bath, it's vapor in a vacuum. Yeah, that's right. That's like the next level sophistication right there. So to really see what this QK65 is all about and how it's constructed, you need to start removing this big stainless steel plate. You flip it over and you undo the four screws. Wait, did I mention that this thing fully built, none of the screws are visible? It's because they use this type of rubber feet that actually covers the screws. Seriously guys, for a $150 keyboard, come on, even my $400 Glacier has exposed screws. After you remove the screws, you lift up like this and be like, whoa, this thing is heavy. Well, because it is. The lower stainless steel weigh actually weighs over one and a half pounds. That's 720 grams. Wait, so what? Well, look at this. The entire case actually weighs 1.3 pounds or 575 grams. The lower weight weighs more than the entire keyboard case. So by adding all of that together, you get pretty much three pounds of an empty case for a 65%. Why is weight important? Well, time for a quick technical segment then. But before we do that, let's get a quick word in from our sponsor, CableMod. So you build this gangster keyboard like this QK65 and you want to complete the look. There's nothing better than a nice matching coiled USB cable to go with this setup. So the guys at CableMod is here to help. In addition to their original custom cable making service, CableMod has recently launched pre-made coiled USB cables in various colors and multiple styles for immediate purchase on Amazon. 
Every cable mod cable is made with high quality inner mod flex sleeving and strong yet flexible outer mod mesh layer for beautiful looks as well as longevity. Unlike the typical DIY custom USB cables that use a heat shrink tube, Cable Mod uses metal USB connector housings for reliable operation so you don't have to end up ripping the connectors off your cable. You can opt for the pro coiled version with the crowd favorite Aviator Quick Disconnect, it's also powder coated, or you can also go with the classic with just a nice coil and the USB connection at the ends. Regardless of the build, Cable Mod offers 14 different colors to complete your look and the classic cable goes for $39.90 while the pro goes for $49.90. And now, even straight ones are offered, and they're right now going for just $32.90 on Amazon with Prime Shipping. So check it out in the description below. When I started to integrate some more of the technical content into my videos, I had a chance to connect with a lot of brilliant subject matter experts in the field. One such individual was Evan. He's actually a noise and vibration isolation mechanical engineer from Australia. That was very long. Um, but he and I had a chance to uh, talk about a lot of different things and he was very, very helpful to help me understand the nature of sound and how I could actually apply that knowledge into keyboards. So if you're a subject matter expert and you want to reach out to me and say, hey Scott, you dumb, let me teach you some stuff, I welcome the conversation. So when it comes to sound in the keyboard, there are two different types that you need to consider. The first one is airborne and the second one is structure-borne sound. So let me show you what the difference is. When you start typing on your keyboard and as the switch activates and the stem collides in the housing, it generates energy, of which one of them is sound. You get the sound that comes from the action that directly goes out into the air and into your ear. That is the first primary airborne sound. Then you have the same sound from the switch that travels into the case that reflects and bounces around and back out and into your ear. That is another form of airborne sound. In addition to the airborne sounds, you have the vibration energy from the key press travel through the switch housing into the plate, PCB, and case that also creates sound. This is called structure-borne sound. When it comes to structure-borne sound, every material or medium the vibration energy travels through, given that it's enough energy to create excitation, it will resonate at its own natural frequency, which in turn resonates into airborne sound as well. So it might be a little confusing, but you know, the, the sound you hear immediately, that's airborne, and the sound that goes through some structure and resonates that structure and then turns into sound, that's considered structure-borne sound. So in this case, you have the plate's own structure-borne sound, the PCB's own structure-borne sound, and then the case's own structure-borne sound as well, when the vibration energy travels through these mediums and causes them to be excited and resonate. So the material the energy goes through matters a lot in terms of the kinds of structure-borne sound it generates, since each material has a different natural frequency. While there are a lot of different factors, two that has a big impact is the mass of the object as well as the stiffness of the object the energy is traveling through in terms of what kind of structure-borne sounds it generates. Today, we're going to be mainly focusing on the topic of mass to help explain what is going on with the QK65 and cases in general. So I mentioned how the QK65 is super heavy. Now I will explain what the significance of that is and explain the reason behind it. So check this out real quick. Isn't it wild how the aluminum lowercase resonates so much, creating an annoying case ringing and ping? And isn't it crazy how adding the steel weight to it completely pretty much kills it off? Well, it's because of the concept of structure-borne sound and how mass impacts it. As mentioned before, as you type on your keyboard, the vibration energy is generated from the switch actuation and ultimately it travels to the case. The case is the largest component that can be affected by this transfer of energy. If there's enough vibration energy that enters the case to excite the case, to vibrate at its natural frequency, this will resonate into airborne sound, the sound that you're going to hear. Well, think about it this way. What is easier to move or excite? Something very heavy or something light? That's right, it's much easier to move something lighter. It's the same in this situation as well. Let's look at the force equation F equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. So in the situation with the QK65 case resonance, let's see what kind of impact mass has on the acceleration required to excite the bare minimum portion of the case versus the case with the weighted steel. So F equals MA, but if you consider your typing force of F is pretty constant, then let's look at this from an acceleration perspective. 
A equals F over M. Acceleration equals force divided by mass. So if the force stays the same, and as the mass increases, then the acceleration will decrease, and vice versa. As mass decreases, acceleration increases. Think of it this way. If you're standing still and you want to run to the end of the room, could you accelerate to your max sprint speed with nothing on or with a 100-pound backpack on your back? It's the same concept. When vibration energy travels to the lightweight aluminum bottom, it's light enough that the vibration energy is also enough to create an excitation. This means the aluminum gets excited and starts to resonate at its natural frequency. When you add the steel to the aluminum bottom, it dramatically increases the weight of the lower case. What happens then? It is harder to excite, so you may get some resonance but at a much lower degree or amplitude. So with the bare aluminum, you're getting a higher amplitude sound resonance versus the heavy steel weighted cases lower amplitude sound resonance. So in layman's terms, without the weight, you get case ping, and with the weight, you don't. There is a whole another layer to this with the stiffness and sound frequency or pitch, but I'll get to that next time. So what is the takeaway? If something is heavier, it is harder to get it to resonate and make noise. If it's lighter, it's easier. That's why light aluminum cases ping very easily. Hopefully that helps to explain why many case designs emphasize the weight and material of the keyboard as well. So now that we have covered on why the QK65 is so hefty, let's move on to its structure. So how does a keyboard that has all these great features and design cost so little? Well, besides some of the outside factors, one major thing is how they went about this case design. The secrets of the QK65 is revealed when you start to further break down the case itself. Once the heavy stainless steel weight is removed, you can see that the non-visible inner components are actually made of casted aluminum. Instead of using a single block of aluminum and milling it out, you're using a cast and molten aluminum to create the case form. This is much quicker and higher output versus individually machining it out. It's also much more cost efficient as well. In addition, it's done in three pieces. This means that you don't have to invest in large blocks of material that is difficult to work with, but rather a combination of smaller parts that is easier and cheaper to manufacture. Plus, if something is invisible, you don't have to do really high-end coatings on it, right? For example, the lower aluminum case is not e-coated like the upper. It's not visible, so it's a way to cut corners where it doesn't matter as much. I still think even with these cost-cutting measures, the QK65 is priced too low, but perhaps their target of a much higher production quantity is then also helping to offset the costing as well. Now that we got some of these case details out of the way, let's continue on with the build. For this build, I decided to go with one of my top choice linear switches, the new Gateron Oil Kings. Especially against the FR4 plate, I think this looks fantastic. For this build, I also decided that the case absolutely does not need the silicone dampener, so I removed that altogether. I did use the poron case foam and the poron plate foam and the PE foam. I know that some prefer not to use the PE foam, but it's all preferential, and I do like the marbly sound, so I stuck it in. I said this before and I'll say it again. While the Duroc V2 stabs are good, they do benefit from holy modding. I feel the OWL stabs deliver the same performance with just lube. So why go through all the trouble, right? One other thing to mention, if you're using the PE sheet, I would actually cut out these little sections here. Because otherwise the stab stem hits it and it does feel a little mushy and I really didn't like that too much. While putting this together, I noticed these little details about this board that was just surprising. Cordy keys even countersunk the screw holes on the plates so the screws will fit flush into it. Honestly, this is something you see on much higher end boards and it's really surprising and really great to see on a more budget oriented board such as this, it's featuring something like countersunk screws. Now to top everything off, I decided to go with the Sakura keycaps by Osumi Caps. Spring is right around the corner and I've been feeling more inclined towards lighter colors, I don't know. Winter sucks, right? Osumi is a team based out of Canada that makes pretty beautifully designed PBT dice up keycaps that I happen to resonate with pretty well. So I really like their thoughtful design. Um, I really also love the play of soft and delicate colors they typically use. And I feel like it's a perfect combination with this smooth white finish. So you know what? I'm going to grab these Sakura caps, put them on. As usual, if you like any of the products that you see, I will link them in the description below. So check it out if you're interested. So this is how the final build it actually turned out. Seriously, when I first built this thing out, I was just wowed at the look and feel and the quality of this board. I still feel that for $150, 
this is a steal. I, I know I keep saying that, but I mean, look at this thing. Nice and clean design, great finishing, and I could tell you, it types like a much more expensive board. In terms of flex, it's not the most flexible board, but it's not stiff either. Remember earlier when I said the USB port was soldered onto the main board? Well, it is, but you know what? There's enough space that the QK65 has to allow for it to move around inside. And this is what it translates to. It's not a trampoline, but at the same time, offers a very nice isolated type of flex that still delivers a very nice feel. It's a very comfortable board to type on. Once fully built out, the QK65 weighs 4 pounds. That is a pretty hefty weight for a 65%. In comparison, you have something like the 75% Keychron Q1 weighing in at around 3.7 pounds and the giant Odin weighing in at around 4.5 pounds. So you can see a tiny 65% is almost the same weight as a huge 1800 here. Now for the final part, how does this thing sound? I mean, I didn't really mean to make this video to cover every foam and plate combination. If you're looking for that, please check out the videos from Cheyu or Near Lucid. They did a great job of showcasing that. But for me, I'm just going to cover what I felt was my optimal build and show off the difference between the FR4 and the palm plates. So here we go. Too many times in this hobby, a new game changer comes in, but honestly, this one truly is one. For $150, extra 20 bucks for E-White, you get a whole slew of different options. You get a clean and sophisticated design, you get great finishing, and also you get premium level typing feel and sound. If they told me that this thing was going to be $250 or even $300, I wouldn't have even flinched. But for $150, I want to ask QWERTY keys, what are you guys doing? Or I could also just ask, truly deliver this keyboard at 150 bucks in stock, no long group buys, and you're doing this hobby a favor and also putting competitors on notice. And for that, you guys get my approval.